Shalom. Some time ago, I had a couple of videos on the apostasy or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So this is a continuation of that um, two videos. And today, I want to deal especially with the most important subject of steadfastness in the age of apostasy. How we can be steadfast in the face of growing apostasy all around us. Now for the text, let's turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, reading from verse 12 to verse 19. Take heed, my brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. However, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now let me refer you to biblical prophecies about the apostasy in the age that we're in today. First, Yeshua himself, Jesus Christ. In the famous end time chapter, Matthew chapter 24, reading from verses 11 to 13. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In these three short verses, there are extremely important points that Yeshua is making. First of all, in the age that we're in, there are many false prophets, false teachers, false apostles. And the sad thing is, they succeed in deceiving many people. And we're talking about Christians and churches being deceived by their false teachings, by their false prophecies. And because of this deception and false teachings and false prophecies, Yahshua said, iniquity shall abound, meaning that sin will multiply on the face of the earth. And he wasn't just concerned with the world outside the church, he was particularly concerned with Christians. The iniquity shall abound among Christians. And then, because of this, the love of many people will grow cold. Love to us who? Love to us God. Love to us our Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. But the promise is there in verse 13. Despite all of these, the Christian 
the believer who can endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Now you notice the future tense of shall be saved. You know, <clears throat> the Bible has a lot to teach us about salvation and what salvation is all about. And uh, salvation has a past tense, has a present tense, and has a future tense. You were saved, you are being saved, and you shall be saved. One day maybe we shall explore these three propositions much more carefully. But right now, suffice to say, as a lot of false teaching about eternal security. Once saved, always saved. In other words, you came to Christ 20 years ago because you attended such a crusade. You went up and made your decision for Christ. You got yourself baptized, became a member of a church, and you are reckoned as having been saved. Never mind what you do with your life the last 20 years. But that's not what scripture says. Salvation has a beginning point. It also has an ending point. And in between, lots of things can happen that will determine the end point. So Yeshua is saying in Matthew 24, don't just look for a starting point, for what happens in the middle, but make sure that your faith endures until the end. And those who can endure until the end, the promise is, you shall be saved, spirit and soul and body. Don't forget we are tripartite being, so salvation that begins in the spirit of man must percolate down to the soul. The soul is the realm of the mind, the will, the emotions, and the final part is the body. Without the resurrection of the body to glory at the first resurrection, don't count yourself saved. And uh, I venture to say, when the day or the hour of rapture comes and many Christians get left behind, then they will certainly have to rethink their doctrines and how they went wrong. Now, I hope that today in my presentation, I'm able to show you what is required of us to endure until the end. In other words, how to be steadfast in our faith, no matter what comes our way, until the end. Now, the end for most of us, or many of us, would be when we die. It could be the rapture. It could be going through the great tribulation. Whatever it is, Yeshua is saying, can you, can I endure unto the end? Can we remain steadfast in our faith, in our allegiance to Him, in our love for Him until the end, no matter what it takes? Now that's the challenge that yes, Scripture presents to us. So that's Yeshua talking about the apostasy in the last days that we are already seeing a lot of. Let's look at Paul. He has several prophecies, but let me just single out one. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, we read, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
and that man of sin will reveal the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Interestingly, Paul begins with the same warning as Yeshua. Deception. Beware of deception. Let no man deceive you. Now the day that Paul is talking about in the previous verse or two in 2 Thessalonians is called the day of Christ. Now many preachers believe that the day of Christ is the same, synonymous with the day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord. But I believe it is not. I believe the day of Christ has to do with the rapture. Okay? And the day of the Lord covers the wrath of Yahweh over a period of time. You see, the problem with many preachers is that they run away with the idea that the day day of the Lord is a particular day, one 24-hour day. That is mistaken. We do know that the day of Christ, if indeed it is the day of rapture, will be one particular day, and not just one particular day, and one particular day where within seconds, the dead in Christ are resurrected, and those of us who are Paul, chosen and faithful, will be rising up in the air, transformed immediately into glorified bodies to meet the Lord in the air. Now that will be, you can call it an instantaneous event, covering just a matter of seconds. Paul says it's just the twinkling of an eye. You, know, you see how fast it is when you twinkle your eye, you blink your eye. That's a very short time. So that's the day of Christ that I believe it is. But more of this sometime in the future because it's important to distinguish which is which. And uh, we'll have a lot more to say about that later. So Paul is saying that day of Christ, the day of rapture, shall not come, cannot come, unless two things happen. One, a falling away, apostasy, departing from the faith must occur. And not only that, but the man of sin, the Antichrist, must be revealed before the event happens. Now, if these two conditions or preconditions are necessary, then we have to revise our thinking about the pre-tribulation rapture and when exactly it occurs. Like many preachers, I was persuaded by the thinking that we will all be raptured when the apostasy takes place, and then after the rapture, the Antichrist will appear. But this passage suggests that he needs, Antichrist must be revealed first, together with the apostasy or after the apostasy, and then the day of Christ will come about. Certainly the day of the Lord, the wrath of the Lord, of Yahweh, will arrive for sure. But more of this uh, later on. But for the moment, mark the important point. Paul is saying there's a time of deception associated with great apostasy. And that's where we're, what we're dealing with in this particular subject. Okay? And what I'm going to show in this two videos, part one and part two, is what it takes for us to be steadfast, to maintain our faith until the rapture or until we die and face Yahweh, failing which, when the Antichrist appears and we are still around, or we're left behind in the rapture, you, you, we shall have the awful dilemma to take the mark of the beast 
and live, have a job, have food, to, de to deny the mark of the beast, decline it, and be destitute, especially your families included. That indeed will be very tough, tough choices. So here let's focus on this. The time of deception, together with a great apostasy, a falling away. Okay. So that's two prophecies, Yeshua and Paul the Apostle. Let's look at Peter, Peter's warning. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. You see, Peter is saying the same thing, warning us to be careful, to be aware. Don't be led away by the error of the wicked. That means false doctrines, false prophecies, false teachings that abound in these last days, right now, where we are at this point in time. Plenty of this. Peter calls it the error of the wicked. Because the threat is that if we fall for the deception, for the wrongful doctrines, we shall fall from our steadfastness. We shall fall away from the faith. We shall be in apostasy like many people. So this is what apostasy really means. It comes from the Greek word apostasia, G646. Very interesting, right? G646. And it simply means a falling away from the faith, a falling away from faithfulness, a falling away from steadfastness. And this apostasy, you can expect, will usher in the Antichrist. Okay? It is preparing the way for the Antichrist. Now, if you've been following the Middle East events recently, you will have seen on TV and read in the media the peace treaties that were signed between Israel and the UAE and Israel and Bahrain. And people expect more such peace treaties to follow between the Arab countries and Israel. Now, I know there are people in Christian circles who rejoice that this will usher in peace for Israel, open up opportunities for Israel, strengthen Israel. But we must ask ourselves the question, is this, are these peace treaties biblical? Much is made of the so-called Abraham Accord. In other words, the Arabs being the descendants of Ishmael and um, Israelis being the descendants of um, Sarah, of, of Isaac. Enemies now become friends. Well, I searched the scriptures. I did not find any particular references to the fact that this will take place. I do find that when Yeshua comes back, the remaining Jews, remaining Israelites will all be saved. And there will be other nations, inclusive of the Arab nations like Egypt and so on, Syria, particularly mentioned. 
will also come to accept Yeshua. But that is when he comes back and not before. So what I see, and others may disagree with me, what I see is a false peace. Because you look at Israel. Are the Israelis in Christ? Except for a very tiny few people, the rest are not. And not only that, but they disavow Yeshua, our Messiah, their Messiah. They say that Messiah has not come in the flesh. They are awaiting a kingly Messiah. And the Apostle John warned us in his first letter, this <coughs> is a spirit of Antichrist. Whoever denies that Yeshua, the Son of God, has come in the flesh, is of the Antichrist. And what about the Arab nations? Uh, we know they're all Muslims. And Muslims do not accept Yeshua as Messiah, as Son of God, as their Savior. So you got both camps really squarely in the camp of what the Bible calls the Antichrist. So you can see that people of the same spirit can agree in that spirit. You see, if you and I have the Holy Spirit, then we can agree in what the Holy Spirit tells us and teaches us. But you and I can be in the wrong spirit and agree in the wrong spirit. So we've got to be careful. What spirit do you have? What spirit do I have? So I'm not... Uh, ecstatic um, at those peace treaties, but rather I see another signpost that these so-called peace treaties, and there have been many more, will actually pave the way for the rise of Antichrist. Why? Because we are told by Daniel the prophet that Antichrist, when he appears, will confirm the covenant for one week. That means you will confirm existing peace treaties for one week. And then in the middle of the week, the week is a period of seven years, break it and proclaim himself as God. So, what we must see is that this is part and parcel of the scenario for the rise of the Antichrist. Apostasy will usher in the Antichrist. Unbelief in Yeshua as Messiah will usher in the Antichrist. And he's going to shock everybody, especially the Israelites, the Jews. They're going to be very shocked because they will receive him thinking that he is the true Messiah because he will come in some kind of power. He will be a world power, a world ruler. So you can see that it's easy for them to be, for people to be deceived. But remember the caution of Yeshua, beware of deception. Be careful of deception. So open our eyes and watch world events. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm going to deal with what I can describe as the roots of apostasy. In other words, what has given rise to apostasy? And when I studied scriptures, I was quite amazed at the number of things that I came up with, number of issues that I came up with. All right. First of all, in the opening uh, verses that I quoted from Hebrews chapter 3, there was mention of two things the deceitfulness of sin and an evil heart of unbelief. Let me restate the two verses, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of of sin. There are two major issues here. 
actually you should put deceitfulness of sin first, the evil heart of unbelief. You see, when we sin and we don't confess, we don't repent, don't get our sins washed away by the blood of Yeshua, sin will lead, lead to further sin. And soon, those areas that are sinful will appear to us as not sinful at all. This is called the deceitfulness of sin. One step down leads to another step down. And the escalator keeps on going down. Deceitful. And our sin will deceive us. So that's why, beloved, we must hasten to deal with sin. Whatever sins there are in our lives. We are assured by the word of Yahweh to the Apostle John in his first letter that if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So, failure to deal with sin leads to deception again. The same word, the same problem, deception, and will lead to the production or the result of a heart of unbelief, which the writer of Hebrews, which is Paul the Apostle, wrote as an evil heart of unbelief. As a preacher, I've had a lot of problems with many Christians and other preachers. When you try to share what is scriptural, very often people turn away in unbelief. Or they find ways and means to escape responsibility for what you're sharing. I once shared with the pastor of a mainline church over lunch some of the truths that I was teaching. He looked at me and he said, if I teach like you, I will lose most of my church. My members will just leave me. And so, sadly, he chose to compromise. And very soon, the unbelief that he has will deepen. And he will teach other people likewise to be unbelieving. Next, <clears throat> the Bible says, if we don't abide in his word, we will be in trouble. We will not see the truth. If we turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Interesting verses, most important verses. Continue. The word continue is most important. It comes to the Greek word meno. The strong number is G3306. And the word meno means to continue, to remain, to abide, to stay in the place that you are at. So what Yeshua was saying to those who profess to believe in, and when he was around doing his miracles, there were plenty of them. But guess what? Very few of the so-called believers were his disciples. Just as in present day churches, very few Christians are real disciples of Yeshua. Why is this so? Because you see, one criterion of being a disciple is if you continue in His Word. What does it mean? See, the Bible is the Word of Yahweh, Word of God, from the first page of Genesis to the last page of Revelation. Nothing is to be 
discarded. We must come to terms with everything that is shown in the pages of the Bible. But guess what? It's like going to a buffet. When people go to a buffet, they pick and choose the things that they like. They discard or ignore those things they don't like. So when they approach the banquet table of the word of Yahweh, Bible, the scriptures, they do the same thing. They take the verses <coughs> that they like, discard others that they find inconvenient. That's right. And, no, and worse than that, they take verses out of context to convey the doctrines that they like to believe. And then, guess what? There are many preachers who cater to such desires for spiritual food, spiritual diet. Just as it's natural, you can go to a dietitian and have a a diet plan for you. Eat this, don't eat that, da 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 da. Well, churches are full of dietitians, preachers, who cater to those who don't want to overeat the good things of Yahweh. They don't want to eat those things which are difficult to chew, difficult to swallow. They like the easy morsels that are sweet just like you know we overeat chocolate and sweet things and grow fat in the process so spiritually you can pick and choose what you like but what Yeshua was saying if you are my disciple you continue in my word you accept everything that's revealed to you you must adjust to my word not the reverse remember. So don't bend the Word of God to your liking. Don't tailor the Word of God to what you like to eat and to digest. And guess what? What Yeshua said. Only those who are disciples will know the truth. And only those who know the truth will really be free in the Spirit free from bondage, free from slavery to Satan, free from slavery to sin, free from deception. The truth is the opposite of lies. That's why truth the opposite of deception. So not everybody will know the truth, only disciples. And the reason disciples know the truth is because they abide in the word. Whatever they read, they accept, no matter what it costs them. We'll look at the cost of discipleship as we go along. This is a big subject, but enough for today that you register this point. And my question to you, my challenge to you is, are you a disciple of Christ? Or are you merely a believer? <laughs> you may not know it, but James the Apostle wrote, even the devil believes in God and he trembles. I know many Christians that believe in God, believe in Yeshua the Messiah, but they don't tremble at all. There's no fear of God in their lives. Interesting, isn't it? The devil does better than most Christians, but unfortunately, he will never find salvation. So another point also has to do with abiding. And this one is even more important. Not abiding in him. I refer you to John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, 
and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If we don't stay in a constant faithful relationship with Yeshua, we cannot bring forth fruit. And if we do not bring forth fruit, one day the Father will come along and cut us off. And when you're cut off from the vine, it's only fit to be thrown to the fire. It will wither and die, be thrown to the fire. Why do we need to abide in Christ? He says, He is the vine, we are the branches. He is the vine, we are the branches. We are grafted onto Him. You've got to understand this from the book of uh, Romans, in chapter 11, where Paul talks about the Jews being part of the natural olive tree. The stem of the olive tree is Christ. The Jews are the natural branch, but they got cut off because of unbelief. We, the Gentiles, are from the wild olive tree. We are grafted onto the holy stem, Yeshua. And Paul says something significant. This grafting is contrary to nature. I've done some grafting of plants and fruit trees. I can tell you this. Normally, to, to get a good fruit tree, you must take a branch from a good fruit tree. Then you can take a wild fruit tree of the same sort, cut off the top somewhere, and graft the good branch onto the stump, bind it up, and if the graft takes, that branch will grow into a tree and produce much good fruit. This is the natural way of grafting. In the spiritual, Paul is saying, the stump, yes, what, is a good tree. We are cut from the bad olive tree. We are grafted onto him. Grafted onto him. Okay? By right, no matter if the graft takes place successfully, we will produce bad fruit. But this is a supernatural graft. When we are grafted onto him, provided we stay with him, no matter what, his sap, the holy sap, will flow into us, flush out whatever is evil in us, and enable us to blossom and to bear fruit. This is the picture of grafting that you must keep in mind all the days of your life. That it's an unnatural graft. We can only do well, survive and do well, and keep well, provided we stick closely to our Saviour, to Yeshua. Don't let Him go. Don't let me grow. Bind yourself to him. Bind yourself. So that you will not be breaking free from him at any time. That's called abiding in him. You think about it. Are you firmly grafted onto Yeshua? Or is the graft not taking, taking place properly? And the branch is about to fall off. Are there group fruits in your life? Because you're not grafted properly, your wild sap will continue to produce bad fruit. So you can see it takes a supernatural power of God to enable us, the wild branch, to produce the good fruit that He wants. That's something that you've got to think about most carefully. It takes a supernatural power of God. Salvation is supernatural. That's why it goes against the natural. We are of the Adam, the sinful Adam. Our nature comes from Him. That has got to be put to death and we must become part of the new Adam from heaven. We must put to death the old Adam but the power of the Spirit live in the new Adam if you want to have eternal life. 
sobering thought, isn't it? John chapter 15 is most important. Study very carefully. We'll come back to other verses there uh, soon. So now we are dealt with abiding in him. Again, the same word, meno, continue in that relationship. The next one will surprise you. Many fall away from the faith because they don't abide in his love. They don't continue in his love. Let me read the verse that may surprise you. Again from John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This love is the agape love. Now, unfortunately, there are any number of preachers who say, God's love for us is unconditional. He will never withdraw his love from us. I don't know where they got that from. Surely, it is a selfless love. Yes, it's a love that sent his son Yeshua to the cross in our place. That's fantastic love. This is unimaginable love. But yet, his love is not unconditional. That's why right. He says, if you keep my commandments, if you obey me, then you shall abide in my love. That's why my love continues towards you. If not, you don't abide in his love, I'm sad to say. Well, show me if I'm wrong. Study John chapter 15 verse 10. If you keep my commandments. That's right. Next, <clears throat> associated with this thought of love, abiding love, and not abiding in love. See, many scriptures point to the same thing. If we turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, Yeshua said to the church in Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That's why. Right. You know, I don't know about you, but if you look at people in, that are in relationship with us, you've got people that are closer to you, and people that are further away from you. In us, we have a continuing, a continuum of relationships. First love, second love, third love, and so on, right? Imagine you are married to your spouse, and uh, when you're married, you say, you're my one and only love. Then five years of the marriage, you find somebody else that you love more than the first spouse. You have left your first love. And when he or she discovers it, that's the inevitable divorce. You see, in human relationships, we find it difficult, isn't it? In marriage, you're in marriage, you find that your spouse is actually looking up to somebody else rather than to you. Care much about, more about somebody else rather than you. Can you take it? Well, the Bible says, or Yahweh says in the Bible, I am a jealous God. He's jealous not in the human sense. His jealousy arises from this, in that Whoever you love as number one, you will get to bear his or her image and likeness. That's right. Have you noticed couples, not many, but couples who live to a ripe old age and are still holding hands? If you look at their faces very carefully, you'll find that they've actually grown very much alike. See? Whatever is your first love, there will be a reflection on you. The reason why Yahweh is jealous about us is that if we love Him first, He's our first love, and we worship Him, 
we will partake of his image and likeness. He says, don't go and worship idols. You will look like that idol. Don't worship other gods. You will look like those gods. You know, many people, when they get into the next world, are going to be very, very surprised how much they look like Satan, how much they look like the demons, and they will really recognize what the Bible has been telling us all along. Keep your first love. Let Yahweh be your first love. Be steadfast to Him. The penalty in terms of this world, the candlestick of the church of Ephesus would be removed, meaning the anointing will be removed. You know, many churches, just like the, the temple in Jerusalem at the time of the high priest Eli or Eli, E L I, the time of the prophet Samuel. There's a verse there which describes the nation of Israel and the temple as Ichabod. In fact, I think it was the daughter-in-law of um, the high priest Eli who named her son Ichabod. And Ichabod in the Hebrew means the glory has departed. But the sad news is the glory has departed from many a preacher. The glory has departed from many a church. Yeah, we can go through the motions of worship, sing beautiful songs, raise our hands, clap our hands, and dance. But if the glory has departed, it is all emptiness. The candlestick has been removed. So beware. Okay. Next point, do not become entangled again. 2 Peter 2.20 For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world to the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That's right. We've been called out of this world when we call our darkness, if we choose to return to the world, choose to return to darkness, we may never get back to Christ because we will be entangled, caught up, trapped by Satan, trapped by the world, and you cannot break loose again. And Peter in the verse of verses following, liken it to a dog eating its own vomit, a pig wallowing in its own uh, discharge. It's not a pleasant scene uh, to talk about, but that's the condition of Christians who are not careful, allow themselves to be entangled again with the things of this world. The next very important point why people fall away is they don't continue the doctrine of Christ. First Timothy uh, chapter 4 verse 16 Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You see against the future tense, you shall save yourself, shall save yourself. The doctrine of Christ. I have a video called The Doctrine of Christ. Abide in the doctrine of Christ. So find out from the videos or videos what exactly is meant by the doctrine of Christ. Uh, the doctrines that we learn, the doctrines that we apply in our lives are most important. You get false doctrines, you get false teachings, non-biblical teachings, you will never make it. But you get the correct doctrines, and that's what Paul said to Timothy. Timothy was a disciple of Paul. He called him his son. He said, follow my teachings. 
follow the doctrines that I've taught you from the time you were young and don't depart from them. Continue in them. You see the word again? Continue in them. Abide in them. And you shall save yourself and your hearers. So preachers have a fantastic, tremendous responsibility. That's right. The words that we preach, if they be the true doctrine of Christ, we will save ourselves and save many. If it's false doctrines, we will lead them to hell. So beware. Okay, let me do deal with one more point and then let's take a break for the first part and then do the second part when we come back. The next point is what Paul warned about not keeping the body under subjection. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, he says, For many walk, whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. What we do to our body. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we should not defile our bodies. We should keep our bodies well, keep our bodies holy. We need to do teaching on this. If you haven't heard this, you better learn this. See? The Christian life is a life of discipline. You can't just do what you want. Okay? We are under the discipline of God himself. He wants us to be a disciplined people. Disciple, discipline, the words are related. So Paul says, I keep my body under sin. In other words, I don't overeat. I take care of my body. I don't abuse my body. Right? You've got the eyes, you've got the appetites, you've got the ears, you've got the tongue. You see how we can sin with the nose? In how many ways can we sin against him? You know, Channel News Asia, which broadcast out of Singapore, recently had a program called belly of a nation, belly, the stomach of a nation. And it's all about Singaporeans' love for food and how they will search out food in hawker centers or market centers and restaurants and so on. They are almost every day obsessed with food, good food, belly of a nation. So the question is, is the God of Singapore the belly? Yeah, Paul says in Philippians, the God is their belly. So many people, the God is their belly. So are you controlled by your belly? Do you worship your belly? <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's, it's a very, very important spiritual point. So with that, let's break off for now, and we'll continue in the second part very shortly. Shalom.